Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the talk on uh, Donnerstagabend in the museum. Uh, my name is Stefan Krause. I'm the director of the Imperial Armory, the Hofjagd und Rüstkammer here in Vienna at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And I'm the curator of the current special exhibition at the KHM, uh, Iron Man, Fashion in Steel or Mode in Stahl. And I am here to introduce our speaker tonight, Pierre Terjanian, or Terjanian. He will be speaking about uh, uh, Ottoman-inspired armor, um, uh, armor in the Alla Turca style in the Renaissance. And before I hand over to Pierre, I will um, introduce him, uh, introduce him with a few words, um, with a few, uh, with a selection out of his very long and extensive CV. Um, uh, Pierre Ter uh, Ter uh, Terchanian is the Arthur Ox Sulzberger curator in charge uh, of the Department of Arms and Armor at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, of art in New York since uh, 2013 he is at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, before that he uh, was um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, in various positions since 1997. Uh, from uh, 2006 until 2012 he was the J.J. Metvekis Associate Curator of Arms and Armor. Um, he has a master thesis from the university in Metz in France. Uh, he wrote about the uh, about armor in uh, Stras armorers in Strasbourg in the 16th and 17th century. Um, uh, recently, a few years ago, in 2019, he uh, curated the, the amazing exhibition "The Last Night: The Art, Armor, and Ambition of Maximilian I" um, in 2019 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, he has, yeah, well, his, his list of publications is very long, two, three pages long. I give you a, a, a selection um, of, of his most important um, uh, publications. Uh, for example, the rediscovery of the Thun Hohenstein album, it's a, um, and a, a sketchbook uh, lost, uh, thought to be lost since 1945, and he rediscovered it and published it in the Jahrbuch of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in 2011 and 2013. He, edited the wonderful catalogue of the Last Night exhibition in 2019. And of course, most recently, in 2022, he wrote uh, an article about Alla Turca armor uh, for the exhibition catalogue of Iron Man fashion in steel here at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And now he's giving us an introduction to the uh, amazing uh, world of Alla Turca armor in the Renaissance, uh, 16th century. And yeah, I'm handing over to Pierre in a second. Yeah, it's all yours. Thank you, Stefan. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, have the, I want to thank the Kunsthistorisches Museum for the opportunity to speak about Armor a la Turca, but also for the wonderful exhibition to which we are lenders. Uh, we got to uh, have a private tour of the exhibition this morning, and we're absolutely thrilled. Um, I contributed an essay on Armor a la Turca because it's an important fashion um, uh, in the 16th century and it lingers into the 17th and the 18th century. And it is not my purpose here with this uh, presentation to speak about the total history of Ottoman influence on European culture, but rather to focus on perceptions in Europe of what might be Turkish uh, as, far as, arms are, as far as armor and weapons are concerned. So the title of my talk is Ottoman's Impression the fashion for Turkish style arms and armor in Renaissance Europe. Okay, so um, this is a portrait of Fernando de Medici in the guise of a, of a Turkish uh, man, perhaps probably a sultan, a Flemish painting of the 17th century. And we, we are here in the, in the presence of a phenomenon whereby uh, Europeans from various backgrounds are uh, fascinated with uh, the Ottoman Turks and this is very much in response to the growing presence that they had in the world, uh, as, and particularly so in, in Europe. The territorial expansion of the Ottoman uh, Empire uh, from the 14th century through the 17th century is nothing short of extraordinary. And uh, what you see here in various uh, shades of, of, of yellow um, is from the, more, uh, from the darker to the, to the lightest, uh, this, the, the different phases of this expansion, but at its uh, uh, peak in uh, 17th century, in late 17th century, uh, a lot of the Mediterranean is basically under Ottoman control, as well as the Red Sea. 
and this advance of the Turks into uh, the Balkans and um, Northern Africa was a source of concern for many European powers, but it was also sometimes received a bit differently. And um, the, it's the responses that are so interesting. To the, friend, to the kings of France, this was an opportunity to erode the influence of the Habsburgs in the Mediterranean and in Central Europe. And um, uh, Francis I, I'm showing a portrait of him here, is infamous for having um, entered into a formal military and commercial alliance with the Ottoman Turks against the Habsburgs. This was done with um, Soleiman, also known as the lawgiver, but um, in the West very much known as the Magnificent, uh, who is uh, responsible to a large extent of further expansion of the Ottoman uh, Turkish Empire into Europe. This alliance um, led to con um, joint military action, for example, with the siege of Nice, at the time part of the Duchy of Savoy, uh, by French and Ottoman forces in 1543. The reality was for um, uh, the uh, adversaries um, a, uh, a, a very uh, perilous situation, and the response to uh, the presence of the Ottoman Turks was not necessarily embracing all things Ottoman. And this is particularly uh, so in Vienna, when in 1529, the city was being besieged, and this is a famous map of uh, Vienna under the first siege uh, by the Ottoman Turks. Whether they were um, liked or disliked, the Ottoman Turks were certainly impressive, and they, made, they struck a, a big impression in European imagination of the Renaissance. And it's very much the figure of the Turk as, as a warrior, as a male warrior that dominates uh, not just the uh, visual arts, but also the performances, literature, and even in music, there's a strong uh, influence of Ottoman military music. They're sometimes represented here um, in their uh, garb, but they're also shown oftentimes as ferocious and uh, uh, warlike. And this is a Janissary, so the personal guard of the Sultan, uh, ready to fire his musket, um, as, as most of the Turks were portrayed. The very beginning of um, Turkish influence in terms of collecting arms and, uh, and armor is uh, already uh, evident in the very beginning of the 15th century. John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, was actually captured at the Battle of Nicopolis. Um, it was, he had to pay ransom to be freed and go back to his estate. You see him in his ring, and he saw the Ottoman Turks up close um, while in captivity. And he, the inventories of his armory indicate that various Greek potentates presented him with Turkish bows and arrows and quivers. And uh, his collection was quite extensive of all things Ottomans by the very beginning of the 15th century. Much later on, and we have um, a documentation of, of various um, uh, collections being formed a, very, a bit later on, and we have a very unique uh, collection being formed, uh, perhaps already in Prague, where Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol uh, first was uh, residing as a governor general on behalf of the emperor, but then also continuing in Ambras near Innsbruck to which he relocated. What was uh, distinctive about the collection of, of weapons that was formed uh, by Ferdinand II of Tyrol was his interest in collecting uh, armor and weapons that had belonged to military leaders of his time. And he was uh, interested in them regardless of their faith or the sides on which they fought. One of the armors I entered this collection is shown here in this catalog, which was published in uh, 16, 1603, uh, illustrating an armor that is actually in the Iron Man exhibition, made for uh, Wilhelm uh, von Rogendorf. But he also collected, um, to the extent that he could, uh, the armor of the great adversaries, the Ottoman Turks, including Sultan Suleiman himself, but also the Grand Vizier Mehmet um, Sokulu, who is shown here on the right. And it is very much to these efforts that some of these pieces have come to us and now to be seen in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. You see in the engraving on the left, a representation of the helmets that is now in the, uh, in the Rüstkammer, in the Hofjagden Rüstkammer in this museum. Some of the uh, weapons he owned were not strictly collected. They were presented to him as gifts. And uh, one of the commanders uh, fighting the Ottoman Turks in Hungary, Lazarus von Schrendi, presented him following the 1566 campaign with a number of trophies of war. So these objects um, came in as uh, spoils of war and as a symbol of the uh, victory against Ottoman Turks. So this um, 
Tur this tuck is a type of swords designed to pierce armor. Maybe Hungarian and Turkish, but certainly is well documented as having come as part of this war booty from the campaign. And interesting enough, all of these objects entering uh, Austria as a result of these campaigns must have informed the taste and the capacity of some of the craftsmen working in Austria. This is a set that was presented to Christian II of Saxony by Rudolf II of Austria. But um, the hilts and the scabbards of these weapons were made in Vienna, very much in a Transylvanian style by a, uh, by a, a goldsmith called Nicholas Gross. Some of the symbolic objects like this janissary cap uh, were particularly important as trophies of war and there would be displays uh, of these, um, of these um, spoils uh, arranged in specific rooms. It was not just in um, Austria on the Habsburg lands um, and um, in the West, Central and, and, and Western Europe, but also in Spain that uh, such trophies were collected. The Battle of Lepanto, which saw the defeat of the an Ottoman fleet uh, at the hands of an alliance of, of the Venetians and the Habsburg forces was is celebrated by Titian in this painting where uh, Catholic faith is um, being uh, defended and, and succored by, by Spain. And another painting that Philip II of Spain commissioned he, uh, celebrates um, the, the victory of Lepanto as a uh, uh, Anus Mirabilis, as a, a special occasion where both he had a male heir and the victory uh, against the Ottoman Turks marked a turning point in their hegemony on the Mediterranean. And you see the spoils of war with the Turkish captive being shown here uh, at his feet. The collection of these objects um, uh, was such that um, they found a home in all the ancestral armories of the Habsburgs. And this is a, uh, the helmet of the commander of the fleet at Lepanto, which is now preserved in the Royal Armory of Madrid. More common trophies of war included standards and flags and banners, as well as tents. There are numerous Turkish tents, most of them for the second siege of Vienna, uh, kept in uh, both in Vienna proper, but also in uh, additional places um, as, as far as, um, as uh, Germany and, and Spain. But not all of the relationship with the Ottoman Turks were hostile. And this is a painting in the Louvre that represents um, the Francesco Gonzaga here in prayer, thanking the Virgin for her uh, su support in the, in, the, in the war against the French uh, b battle of Farnovo, where they were defeated. This was painting just a year after. And he was on excellent terms with the Ottoman Turks uh, because they were helping him uh, against uh, Venice, among other uh, rival powers. He was actually um, um, sending them armor that, we commit, that he was having made uh, for them, and they included brigandines, a type of armor that's shown in this painting. It's a textile garment that is lined on the inside with metal plates. And they were custom made for all kinds of Ottoman of officials as well as the sultans. And in return, Bayezid II, this is what a uh, brigandine looks like on the inside, but it's a later example. Sultan Bayezid would send him uh, Turkish bows and Turkish weapons in, that were then kept in his armory as a proof of the friendship that united him uh, with the Ottoman Turks. So Ottoman weapons were gifted by the Ottomans to European courts, but they were also sometimes gifted among European sovereigns. In this case, Christian II of Saxony was the recipient of numerous uh, Turkish weapons, which then uh, became the nucleus of a collection that was called the Turkish Kama, uh, which is uh, now installed in its splendor in the Kunstsammlung in Dresden. They were mostly the gifts of Francesco de' Medici, who had access to this material. It's not clear whether the Medici's were able to get them as diplomatic gifts, purchase, or whether they were themselves trophies of war. But they were coveted items, and um, some of them have survived. There's this Turkish helmet, which was once entirely gilded, which is now in the Turkish Akama in, the, in Dresden, as part of these gifts from the Medici to the electors of Saxony. There were other contexts in which the image of the Turk looms larger, which includes all kinds of festivities and ceremonies. Some of them were rather private. After a tournament, it was commonplace to have a masquerade or some, um, uh, or a mask as we can call it. And this is a, from the time of Maximilian I of Austria. And the uh, image that I'm showing is actually uh, featured in the exhibition Iron Man. Here, there are courtiers of Maximilian 
dressed in the guise of Turks. And um, with this close up, you may be able to see that they're actually wearing masks, but complete with turbans and, um, and, and Turkish outfits and Turkish sabers. These objects had to be made for those ceremonies, creating a demand for objects that could not always be obtained directly from the Ottoman Turks or on battlefields, but had to be created locally. In France, which remained alive with the Ottoman Turks for almost 250 years against the Habsburgs, uh, those things uh, resonated a bit differently. Henry II of France, successor of Francis I, shown here, uh, adopted Turkish bows as his emblem and the crescent moon as his personal emblem, perhaps in celebration of this connection with the powerful uh, Ottoman Turks. When he was entering in triumph uh, after his coronation, uh, the various cities in France, he was often uh, surrounded by Turks. It's not clear whether they were Turkish ambassadors or they were um, participants from his own court dressed in the guise of Turks. In front and, um, and, uh, and behind his carriage here, there are several individuals that are wearing turbans and Ottoman sabers and, and dresses. In tournaments across Europe, and especially so in the German speaking lands, the, the Turk become a fixture of the celebrations. This is a celebration of the baptism, of the birth and baptism of an heir to the, to the um, state of Brandenburg. And there is actually a Turkish figure in the foreground here, um, but somehow included in this uh, procession leading to the uh, lists where the tournament will be taking place. And we have ample visual evidence that it became very common for courtiers to dress up as Turks in the front here. You have Janissaries playing Turkish like music. And then behind them, you have various figures in armor. I'm sorry, we equipped as uh, Turkish warriors with lances and sabers. The Prince Elector of Saxony himself, Christian II, is leading the, uh, the, the procession and uh, dressed as a Sultan. And we have to remember that these processions were um, uh, sometimes deeply political, but they were often moralizing as well. And this is um, an example of a procession in which the participant is dressed as rabbits. And what they're bringing back with them are the heads of the hunters and the dogs that were chasing them. So this is a celebration of the world upside down. And it always invited reflections as to um, the proper order of things. And those processions could be as fanciful as having also cross-dressing. In this case, various members of the Saxon court are dressed in the guise of women, sometimes Amazon, sometimes the more allegorical figures. And there's a very similar um, um, uh, example in the exhibition of what was going on at Habsburg courts. So the understanding of what constituted Turkish uh, military gear was sometimes very precise, as is the case of this um, print. And it was adopted uh, for those processions. So we're here at the very beginning of the 18th century, and there's our Saxon soldiers dressed as Janissaries with very realistic equipment, uh, including the firearms. Sometimes there's more artistic license, and this was um, this is a representation of one of several nations that participated um, in a um, tournament organized in 1662 at Versailles. And uh, what you're seeing here is the, the Frenchmen disguised in the, as, as Ottoman Turks. They're uh, representing uh, the, uh, this nation. And one of the members of the, of, the, of the princely family of Condé, the Grand Condé, is here representing himself as an Ottoman Sultan. But interestingly enough, there are other nations being represented, including the Persians, as an alternative to uh, if powerful Asian uh, neighbors. And this is the kind of, um, this is a, still the 1620, 1662 um, um, event. I apologize, not in Versailles, actually played at, at the Tuileries um, in Paris. And it gives you an idea of the scale of these events in which those various in, uh, embodiments of, of foreign nations were uh, represented. In the German speaking land, sometimes uh, entire th so theaters were created for something that looked more like a, a, a skirmish in which um, horsemen were fighting each other. And uh, the, all of this was uh, beautifully choreographed. The celebration of the Ottoman Turks was sometimes very ambiguous. At times they were demonized and seen as the enemy and there was a script whereby they would lose in a mock combat. And there were other occasions where this was more a celebration of the world. 
And in this case, this was a, a carousel, a form of uh, tournament that was celebrated in the beginning of the 18th century in Dresden, in which um, Asia is represented by the Ottoman Turks, and they represent one of the four continents that make up the world. For Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol, it was important to represent um, some of the defenders of, of, of Habsburg Europe and uh, the uh, Catholic and Christian faith against the Ottoman Turks, and he often disguised himself as a, as a hussar, as a Hungarian hussar. Those were the um, allies of the Habsburgs who were fighting um, directly in the buffer, uh, buffer states uh, with the Ottoman Turks. So this is a representation of what a hussar might look like. And um, this is the Archduke Ferdinand himself uh, shown um, wearing a mask and uh, equipped as a hussar. Members of this court is obviously wearing a mask for this purpose with fake mustache but wearing an actual, carrying an actual mace and a sword that had been made for the occasion. Members of this court also represented uh, the hussars. And um, we find very similar phenomenon in other uh, courts, including here again in Saxony, where various courtiers are, represent, are, are dressed as Hungarians. And there is a version of the hussar as, as, as it was known. So that's a light horseman, lightly armored horseman. As uh, they were known uh, both in Bohemia, but also in Lithuania, in Poland, and in uh, in Hungary, wearing um, a helmet uh, with very distinctive uh, pointed um, skull and a type of shield that is very triangular in profile, which is known as Flügeltasche in German, or as a wing shield in English. And some of these examples were made in Austria for those ceremonies. This is one that was uh, made probably in, in, in Innsbruck. Uh, for the celebration of the marriage of Ferdinand II with Anna Caterina Gonzaga. So these are imitation of these shields made specifically for the occasion. But we can trace the, the roots of, these, of this model of shield back to Central Europe. Um, this is a uh, manuscript celebrating uh, the reception that was organized in Hungary for Anne de Foix Candal, who was raised at the French court and who was going to marry um, uh, Ladislas the king of um, Hungary. And the horseman in the front here is carrying one of his very distinctive hussar's shield. We have battle paintings from the early 16th century that's very uh, complex and rich in details, showing here um, Polish or Lithuanian hussars wearing no armor but carrying these very distinctive shields and uh, charging their Muscovites, which they routed at this famous battle uh, with their lances and you have multiple views of what that would look, look like. This shield was very much emblematic of uh, what those Eastern, Eastern European and Central European horsemen looked like. They were quickly appropriated. Some were made um, in the German-speaking lands, and this is an example in the Kunsthistorisches Museum's collection. This is a pictorial, pic pictorial inventory of shields uh, that were kept in various arsenals of Maximilian across uh, the Habsburg lands um, as far as Alsace and, uh, and the, the Breisgau. And you're seeing them um, in multiple colors and finishes. But some were made certainly for Maximilian's uh, uh, personal troops as well. And this is an example that is now faded, but it has the crosses of Burgundy or Saint Andrew, which is the patron saint of, of, the, of the Burgundian order of the Golden Fleece. And it actually has traces of uh, Maximilian's personal motto Haltmas in Allendingen, uh, which is also um, can translate it as keep measure in all things. So these um, objects were, were um, created very specifically for Maximilian's court. A lot of um, individuals originating from Central and Eastern Europe uh, identify with these shields. And this is a um, person who represented himself in an album to um, say, I was here, I am your friend. And his coat of arms is painted on the side and he's represented carrying this shield. He's clearly coming uh, somewhere from like Bohemia or perhaps Lithuania. And an artist, an Italian artist here uh, active in Mantoa, um, represented the same type of gear with his pointed helmet and the shield. And the caption is very interesting. It says here, it's good to use in masquerades. Um, this type of outfit is to be seen in Bohemia and Muscovy. So it's a very wide uh, span of land in which uh, this type of armor and this type of equipment was to be seen. And the tournaments were organized by Ferdinand II of Tyrol. 
This one was uh, took place in Vienna. You have actually uh, the horsemen being completely armored, but the armor is invisible under the clothing. And um, even the helmet, which is a closed helmet as would be used in a, normally, a normal knightly tournament, is given the semblance of being a hussar's helmet by being having a cover uh, that is uh, rising at the apex um, in the manner of the typical helmets worn by the hussars. Such shields have survived. There is an example actually in the Kunsthistorisches Museum that you can see here with the stripes. And interestingly enough, these objects are deeply ambiguous and I think they illustrate the tensions between what was considered Turkish and what was considered uh, Western European. It's not so simple. This is an album of various pieces of armor and equipments that were available for sale by lottery, which is in the Metropolitan Museum's collection. It was compiled in the, during the second half of the 16th century. It's painted on vellum. And this shield here is identified as one of two, so two Turkish targes or shields. These shields were also associated with the Ottoman Turks. And we find this in this carving here. Uh, made in Augsburg around 1522, which is an allegorical carving of vice and virtues at the court of Charles V. In the background is a representation of ancient history in which Ottoman Turks are carrying these distinctive shields. The same shields appear on woodcut prints dating from right after the siege of Vienna, in which the Turks are equipped with these very distinctive shields, otherwise known as the Tsar's shields. They're found in various paintings, including this altarpiece here, uh, which celebrate a divine intervention uh, that led to a, a brief victory against an Ottoman Turk force by Ludwig of, of, of Louis of Hungary. And the Ottoman Turks here are shown carrying these shields. They're found in all kinds of objects, including this chessboard, in which you have Turkish uh, warriors in turbans holding against a mace on the right hand and then the very distinctive shield in the left. Eyewitnesses who traveled to Constantinople represented the shields as well, carried by various types of Ottoman forces. So the same shield was basically seen on the Habsburg side and, 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 and as far as uh, Poland, and they were to be seen also in Turkey, carried by various warriors. Sometimes the shields were painted with a representation of wings or feathers, and sometimes they were literally covered in feathers. And this is a representation of a type of troops known as the Delhi, but also sometimes as the Akinci. They were um, uh, shock troops that were typically used as scouts by the Ottoman Turks. And they were basically uh, like the Hussars on the forefront of marching armies, recognizing the terrain and um, are very prone to skirmishes and to har harassment tactics. If we move away from Western sources, we have court paintings, illumination in Istanbul that show memorable episodes of Suleiman's life. In this instance, a, uh, a battle that happened um, in 1526, in which you went have this uh, uh, Delhi uh, or, or Akinci um, uh, Turkish warriors fighting uh, a Western European clad in armor, but both carrying the same kind of shield. There's, of course, a great degree of simplification. It's not clear whether these artists had ever seen a battlefield, but they didn't think it was inappropriate for both sides to be equipped as shields. There are numerous other um, illustrations of the shield being used by both Christian and uh, Muslim forces in the context of the wars in Central Europe. And in the background of this picture, you see that the Europeans are clearly identified by wearing armor, though simplified and the Ottoman Turks by wearing other types of headgear and next to nobody armor. But in the foreground, on the left, you have a Hungarian um, clad, again, equipped with the, with the shield, and you have the, um, a horseman on the opposite right, which is, again, uh, fighting on the side of the Ottoman Turks, equipped with the same shield uh, here, decorated with a wing. And many of these shields have survived. You find them as far as St. Petersburg in the Hermitage Museum, and of course, um, many of them in Austria. It is not always clear what, this, um, what the design on them is representing. It certainly may have been rooted also in heraldry. A lot of the Hungarian coats of arms uh, and uh, Serbian coats of arms represent the very same, similar design. And in some instances, shields painted with this design on the outside have crucifixion uh, scenes on the inside. So while they may look like they were made for Nakinchi or for a Delhi uh, horseman fighting on the Ottoman side, 
the presence of a crucifixion scene on the inside makes it clear that they were carried by Christian warriors. There are several examples of these. I could not find better images. Some of them still keep in, kept in situ in Hungary. And the Metropolitan Museum has actually one example, which has um, a crucifixion scene on the inside and on the other side, on the exterior side, the one that everybody would see, a hand holding a bifurcated sword. This sword is well known in, um, in Islamic culture as Dulfakar. It's a sword, is the sword of Ali. It's a sword that had two blades. It's um, uh, very much associated uh, with the Shiite um, faith, but it's also very much an emblem of the Sunnis, uh, specifically so in the Ottoman context. You find a depiction of the sword, for example, on the Ottoman standards. You see here a galley, a, um, a part of the Ottoman fleet, uh, with a, a standard uh, showing the sword. And um, the typical Ottoman shield of the period looks, looks nothing like what we've been looking at. They tend to be round, they make a, of, um, of a organic materials um, wrapped in silk. And yet it is clear that some Ottoman forces were carrying um, uh, the flugeltasche or the uh, uh, Hussar's shield. One possible explanation for the diffusion of the shield and confusion as to whether this was a Ottoman shield or actually a shield of the Hussars who were fighting the Ottomans may have to do with the tactics and the military system used by both sides. Hungary at the time was split into three different states, one occupied by the Ottoman Turks, another one which was very much occupied and, and, and aligned with the Habsburgs who uh, had the title of the Kings of Hungary, and then Transylvania, almost an independent state, um, also um, sandwiched in between these two rival powers. Both tended to fight military campaigns on site by living, by living provincial troops that were recruited locally for uh, at times of military campaign that were found in the Balkans, including Serbia, but also in Hungary. And this is a, the wing of an altarpiece, which is in Schloss Eggenberg in, in Graz, where you see some of these troops that are also known as Stradiot. Those were um, former Byzantine troops uh, mostly composed of Albanians, but also of Greek um, that uh, were displaced after the fall of Constantinople. Many of them resettled in Italy and being extraordinary horsemen that were um, invited by not only the Habsburgs, but also by uh, Henry VIII of England, by the Kings of France to become auxiliary forces in all of the armies. They're very distinctive for wearing these hats, very tall hats with a, a short brim and for the very long mantles um, that they're covering. They must have carried these types of shields as they're shown here. And they brought with them this style wherever they went. Some of them fought on the Turkish sides. Some of them fought on the, uh, on the Habsburg side. And it is known that they sometimes changed sides. They were very much mercenaries. And these shields were so put in as symbols that they found all kinds of uh, unnatural expressions where instead of being made of primarily of wood and painted, Imitations were made in steel for Maximilian. Uh, there's an example on the left, but even much later example uh, made perhaps for the Spanish court. And the, this one on the, on the right is now kept in the uh, Royal Armory of Madrid. Perhaps one of the most splendid example was made for Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol entirely of silver. And what you're seeing here is the horseman's figure, which includes a saddle with the silver, with silver plates, the stirrups also made of, of silver, the helmet, the shield itself, was melted down and therefore is not to be shown. Here is a view of the saddle, which is in the exhibition, Iron Man. And this helmet, this photograph doesn't do justice to the extraordinary workmanship of this helmet, which was clearly made to look like a hussar's helmet, but made perhaps by the silversmith working in Austria. The inspiration for this helmet is also ambiguous. The hussars were wearing helmets that seem to have had their origin in the Islamic world. The earliest known example of such helmets, which have an open face, a nasal defense that slides over, that slides through a peak right over the eyes, a domed top, oftentimes with a finial, cheek pieces suspended in the back, and some flaps to protect the nape, surface uh, first in the Mamluk world in Egypt or in Syria. Here are two examples. The Ottoman Turks were very quick to adopt them themselves, and some prestigious examples decorated in gold were made um, by workshops working for probably in Istanbul 
for the Ottoman court. Uh, there is a helmet here um, on the left, which is in the Kunsthistorisches Museum's collection, which belonged to a grand vizier. And there's on, and, and there's on the right side, another example that was presented as a diplomatic gift to the, to the Muscovites, and which is now in the Kremlin. These helmets were worn also in those buffer states that we just mentioned. Stefan Batory became king of Poland, but he was also voivode or governor general, effectively ruler of Transylvania. And he's wearing here an armor perhaps made in Bohemia, which has Christian symbolism on it. But the helmet which he, uh, which he wore and which, he donate, which was donated to the collection of, of heroes of Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol is an Ottoman helmet. So it didn't, there was no um, a problem with combining uh, this Christian iconography with a helmet that he must have received for the Ottoman Turks. There are certainly examples of these helmets, very we call Zischege in German, um, um, coming from perhaps from the Turkish word Schitschak or Hungarian word, which is very similar. These helmets were certainly also locally made in Hungary, and this is a very good example of, of the type. It belonged to Mikrozini, who defended heroically a fortress against the Ottoman Turks at Suleiman at present and leading the campaign, and he was beheaded after having uh, been captured. Uh, however, the fortress was not surrendered and was destroyed uh, with his wife um, uh, blowing herself up with the fortress and uh, not surrendering. So he's very much regarded as a stoic defender of um, the Habsburg's land and, and, uh, and, and uh, against Ottoman advances, which is why his helmet uh, was incorporated into uh, Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol's armory. These helmets were so popular that they started being made in Germany in a massive scale. And these are examples that were made in Nuremberg. Um, these two examples are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They're missing the brim, they're missing the cheek pieces, but the bowl are intact. And they come in various shapes and forms with various kinds of decoration. And the one that I'm showing here has a mark engraved on it, which shows that they were captured by the Ottoman Turks. They were used against them and then kept in the arsenal of the Janissaries in St. Irene in Constantinople. These helmets were also made not just in Nuremberg, but in Augsburg. And this is an album of armor designs, uh, which was recently rediscovered, documenting the work of an Augsburg armor, perhaps Matthias Frauenpreis. So these uh, helmets could be made plain or richly decorated with etching. And the album of an armor etcher also working in Augsburg, Jörg Zog, is here showing how um, the many different patterns that he could create to adorn these helmets, which were intended for Central European clients. The exhibition Iron Man includes one of these very early examples, which was made for Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol and worn at the Hussars tournament in Vienna in 1549. Not all Turkish style um, helmets uh, had this pointed uh, top. They sometimes came with a more of a hemispherical skull. And that inspired, too, the design of more compact style of Zischige in Germany. This is an example which is in the Bayerisches National Museum in Munich, which is particularly splendid for its ornamentation and the gems that adorn its surface. In the exhibition Iron Man, you have the helmet that I'm showing here on the left included. And their designs are also made to have a breastplate and a backplate. This was an ensemble known as a cuirass with helmet that was in, they were intended as gifts for Sinan Pasha, the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Turks. This was at a time when negotiations were on the way to maintain a truce between the, the Habsburg lands and the Ottoman Turks. Tribute had to be paid, and Sinan Pasha left, um, um, made it very clear that he intended to receive gifts as part of the discussions for himself and some other officials and these um, if efforts were therefore made to find something suitable for the Grand Vizier. The cross was to be made in Augsburg, and these are the drawings that were submitted for the approval by Rudolf II. This is more what body armor looked like as it was used in Ottoman Turkey, not much to do with what we've just been looking at. Nevertheless, those armors as created in the German speaking land seem suitable enough for presentation to the Ottoman Turks they, they must have been um, uh, very much emblematic of this in-between of those areas in which uh, troops were also recruited and uh, where equipment could be obtained. This is an example also in the exhibition of the cuirass um, and this uh, Alaturka or um, uh, made in, in the German-speaking land. 
There's a perhaps closer example to what they would have looked like um, uh, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'm showing here on the right side. And what's so interesting about it is the presence of all of this glass space. Many of these armors were adorned with uh, semi-precious stones and sometimes um, um, uh, actual diamonds. You see the back of this armor, and this armor comes to the ancestral armory of the Counts Kevenhuller, uh, uh, who moved their armory away from Austria at the time of the Thirty Years' War. They were Protestants, and they were permitted by the emperor to remove their armory uh, to Nuremberg, or to the area near Nuremberg. There's an example that is now missing in the gems in the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is also in this very much in this style, and I'm showing it here because it has, again, the mark that shows that it was captured by the Ottoman Turks and it was kept in St. Irene in Constantinople. So we have here um, objects that would have been suitable as gifts to Ottoman officials, and we have clearly some that would have been suitable to be worn by their enemies in combat, and they were actually captured by the Ottoman Turks, showing how this notion of what was Hungarian and what was Turkish was a very fluid definition. Among the gifts intended for Sinan Pasha were this male shirt uh, adorned with stars, crescent moons, and various uh, gems. This was to be made by a uh, Nuremberg mail maker, so not in Augsburg, but in Nuremberg. And a shirt very similar to this uh, survives uh, in Hungarian National Museum. I'm showing an image of it here. And perhaps you can better see how similar the clasps for closing it are. Uh, the presence of what looks like a, a chain collar that is actually uh, attached permanently to the shirt is interesting enough. Uh, 90 years before, Maximilian intended to present to the, to the great Valak, he called it, to what would seem to have been the Prince of Transylvania, a very similar shirt. He describes it in detail. It needs to be made of very small lengths. It must be adorned with stars and crescents. And he had a very defined idea of what would have been suitable uh, for um, for Valachia. So we know that this style of armor was already in existence at the very beginning of the 16th century and still being made through the beginning of the 17th century. They sometimes come with gauntlets or gloves made of metal. Um, the links that are made up these armors are not made of iron but actually made of copper and then they're silvered. In this instance in our in the Metropolitan Museum's collection we have a very rare pair of these, of these gauntlets. One still retains the star and the semi-precious stones, and the cuffs are made of small articulated copper plates that have been silvered, very much like this cuirass, which was made for Nicolas Esterhazy, which is in the, in the Esterhazy collection. So we see here a sort of hybrid mail and plate uh, uh, type of armor, neither used in Western Europe nor used by the Ottoman Turks, but have been suitable in Hungary and in Transylvania. Perhaps what defined um, more in the European imagination, Ottoman armor more than anything else, was a sense of ostentation, opulence, and sophistication. And the presence of, gem, of gems was one of the defining features. This is one of these extraordinary helmets that is missing its cheek pieces that is uh, kept in Topkapi Palace, uh, made in the late 16th century. It gives you an idea of how uh, elaborate those helmets could be. And they often came complete with arm guards that would have covered um, the arms um, of the war in the Turkish fashion. They have a lot to do with goldsmith's work. Um, and this is a picture made of rock crystals, similarly adorned in gold and with various gems. And this informed the wildest um, imagination in terms of what, what constitutes a Turkish armor. Here is a helmet that is now stripped of the lapis lazuli crest, a very large figure that would have been on the very top of the helmet. With many of the gems, it included turquoises, but also diamonds and rubies uh, that were uh, probably removed at the time of financial crisis. This is an imaginary Ottoman helmet. Doesn't look like anything Ottoman except for a summary representation of a turban around uh, the crown. This is part of a very large ensemble of uh, armor that were presented by Charles Emmanuel of Savoy. He was married to the sister of Philip III of Spain. And Philip III and his wife had been unable to have any heirs. Charles Emmanuel of Savoy was very much seeing an opportunity for his three sons to be raised at the court of the Philip III. And because of his connection through his wife to the court, to perhaps make one of them the future heir to the crown of Spain. This is Philip III um, uh, shown here in, in his armor. 
And the three boys went to Spain to be raised there. This is the oldest of them, Philippe Emmanuel of Savoy. As part of their arrival was a very lavish gift, which included an armor for horseback and for foot, two horse armors, and this ensemble of Turkish pieces for parade, which appear to have been made for the Duke of Savoy himself 20 years earlier, and they were repurposed as a magnificent gift. The idea was not so much that Philip III should wear somebody else's armor. It was more that they may be placed inside the Royal Spanish Armory and they will inscribe the House of Savoy in the future of the armory and the collective memory of what made Spain a superpower. As I mentioned, some of, the, some of these objects were stripped of what uh, made them so special, all of the gems. These are now, this is a pair of arm very much inspired by these Turkish-like arms that are now in the Bargello. And all you have is the iron core. Virtually all of the gold is gone and none of the gems. But they're very much inspired by this type of armed defense. And I was very pleased to see this uh, piece, which is in the in the Hofjag in the Ruskammer and the Kustis Museum in the exhibition, Iron Man, very much associated with Suleiman the Magnificent. This is um, a sort of very distinctive type of Turkish uh, armor, showing, showing you a close up here, which was very faithfully copied elsewhere. So the pieces that I'm showing on the left is uh, repeating the same gold design on the on the center. And clearly the craftsman who um, created this had access to actual Ottoman pieces. This is, was made in Moscow in the early 17th century. So we see that in Russia, it was a very literal and faithful reproduction of Ottoman designs. And in Western Europe, we see a much more liberal and uh, understanding of what constituted Ottoman arms. One of the few objects uh, that retain all of the original surface and embellishments and that were part of uh, Duke of Savoy's gift is this shield, one of two, which is uh, adorned with cameos, uh, elaborately carved, retain most of the gems and all of the gilding as well as the original textile uh, lining. And this has nothing to do with uh, Ottoman equipment, but it represents an impression of Ottoman splendor as seen from Milan and then now reverberating from Spain. So in as much as we, uh, the relationship with uh, the Ottoman Empire was a conflictual one and the expansion of their territories was a cause of concern and therefore the imagery of the Ottoman Turks is often one of a very hostile neighbor, you have here a reinforcing breastplate for an armor mage for Charles V and I'm showing you a detail here of St. James Matamoro so the killer of the Moors, here are trampling in Ottoman Turks. Um, a very clear message for an imperial armor to ce celebrating the opposition to the Ottoman Turks. And as much as this relationship was often framed in terms of conflict, conflict and resistance in the Habsburg courts, it was not always quite that simple. And this is a, a page from a fishing book of Maximilian I. So we're here back to the very beginning of the 16th century, and it's about fishing in Tyrol. And somehow this uh, representation of various fishing activities in Tyrol includes a, an Ottoman Turk that somehow inserted himself in the composition. Um, the, there was something captivated about uh, these uh, powerful rivals and adversaries that made it irresistible, it had to be included in the composition. So I end my presentation here. I think um, we have um, a lot of work to do. We, what, what is clear enough is that the understanding of what constituted uh, Turkish fashion was very much shaped by the Balkans and by, by the, the states that were sandwiched in between the Habsburg lands and the Ottoman Empire. And that the military practice of hiring and recruiting light, lightly armored horsemen in those territories have a lot to do with the dissemination of objects that were seen as foreign in, um, in the West and therefore framed as Turkish and then seen by the Turks themselves as being Balkanic or being Central European and foreign too. So we don't have archetypes of what constitutes Turkish armor in this fashion. What we have actually is a lot of creativity around the confusion. Thank you very much. I just see uh, comments. What, what a great idea for the Kunsthistorisches Museum to present all these treasures online, I hope that um, uh, further Zoom lectures um, will, will be organized around the exhibition until um, 
the commentator can come to Vienna. Uh, we have um, uh, here an audience uh, from Munich and from, um, from around the world, I'm sure. Uh, I haven't seen the specific questions yet. But I have with me uh, Dr. Krauser, who, who may want to ask a question. <laughs> putting pressure on me. <laughs> um, uh, going back to the, 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 the hunting scene, if you, can, if you can go back one or two scenes, there's something uh -huh. I, maybe that's also interesting. It's, uh, a, it's not a very high resolution image, but I, I, I'm yeah. happy to share it again, if that's okay. Yeah. This one, yeah, because we know that Maximilian, the, the, he, he welcomed an, an ambassador, for the Turkish or Ottoman ambassador in, I think, in 14... 90s or so in Stams in Tirol, uh -huh. and they erected a little village out of tents for the Ottomans to welcome them. And this must have had a, 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 a big impression on Maximilian. And uh, I think this, uh, and he saw Ottoman culture himself, so nothing, nothing up close, uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. up close, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and the real Ottoman culture. Um, so this must have had a, a very big impression on him and it, I wonder if this is why he included um, uh, like Ottoman warriors in, in, in various of his, his, his illuminated books uh, that were made for him. For example, this hunting book here. Thank you, because I, I, I was not aware of any Ottoman military incursion in Tyrol, so I thought... Not this incursion, is a, diplomatic this, visit. This, this, this is a difference. diplomatic visit, precisely, so yeah, that yeah, maybe explains yeah. the and There is another painting, painting, a hunting scene, uh, a copy after a lost original in our collection, which also includes uh, Ottoman figures. So this must have had... They, 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 you see them, if you look closer, you see them in, in, in a whole range of works from the Maximilian court. Thank, thank, thank you, Stefan. No, that was not a question, but no, 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 <laughs> it was. No, no. Um, I, I should say that for the purpose of this presentation, I had to rely heavily on visuals. And there are wonderful textual references to things that are earlier, it's beginning in the, fourth, in the early 15th century and through the 15th century, of uh, all kinds of tournaments involving Turk Turks uh, or figures of Turks in France, in Burgundy. In, uh, in, in Italy, and there were no visuals to be shared in this presentation, so I limited myself to what I could, what I could where we could picture together. Um, but the phenomenon is much broader in that sense, geographically speaking and chronologically speaking. There's a lot already happening in the 15th century. Ah, so I see a question whether there were Italian armorers, uh, whether they did armor in the Turkish style. This is a difficult question. <laughs> Um, we are, I am not aware of an Italian, there are lots of Italian armors making reference to the figure of the Turk and there is a helmet in the exhibition that shows a, a, a parade helmet showing a Turk held by his mustache um, that forms the, the crest of the helmet. But these are just uh, more traditional imageries of the Turk, Turks being dominated and, and being, uh, being controlled. It's not so much that Turkish armor is present as an inspiration for this helmet. The pieces that I shown that were a presence of the Duke of Savoy appear to be among the very few examples of definitely Italian made armor that um, present an idea of what might be Turkish. But I have not come across any close version. It seems to be much more anchored in the German speaking world. Yes. Um, I have another question about, um, we've, we've heard about a lot about uh, Turkish and Ottoman influence on, on European arms and armor. What about European influence on Ottoman mm -hmm. arms and armor? Do we know or do you know um, any, any, anything about it? So um, I, 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 we have to believe that since some of these gifts took place, these diplomatic gifts took place, some of these European made crosses and helmets were definitely seen at, back in Constantinople or wherever the officials were garrisons, these brigandines that um, the Gonzaga were saying, sending already in the 15th century, they were not just sent to back to the courts, they were sent to various of governors of, of different districts. They were wearing European style armor. It's not clear how much of that was imitated, but it's also about how you define European. So if we consider that these Hungarian lands where these shields were favored and the Zishiga were popular, to what extent were they then influencing back the Ottoman Turks? There are very few examples, but there's some examples of Ottoman figures commissioning 
uh, in Hungary armor for their own use and then as a, a sort of a gesture of neighborly of being a good neighbor it's even times at, at times of conflict they say we understand that these are difficult times but could I have an a helmet made um, uh, in Hungary for, for myself and and so we know that there was a demand for European made pieces but whether then the armors working for the Ottomans um, mimic the European armor not so much not so much here. Yes, I have a question in the room. The rise and fall of the empires are dependent on capital, on the lack of such the weaponry. Mm -hmm. It's well, there, there's one argument that the rise of the Turkish Empire happened or coincided with the fact that the Jews were expelled from Spain. They sold the capital and went on the monastery and traveled to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Do you so I will repeat the question, um, a question in the room of whether um, the, uh, the rise and fall of empires uh, rests on, um, on, on capital and military equipment and the extent to which the expulsion of the Jews from Spain fueled um, the, um, um, it brought some know-how to uh, armor making and armament making in Ottoman Turkey. Uh, I, I have no direct evidence of this happening, but I think we, what we do know is that the Ottoman Turks came from a, a nomadic tradition for a very long time, and when they um, conquered Constantinople, they were very quick to adopt all kinds of Byzantine uh, technologies as well as administrative processes, and that what is, uh, was defined as Ottoman in the 14th century is not the Ottoman of the 16th century. They have, um, have they're very prone to um, absorb uh, technologies from the outside. When they besieged Constantinople, it was with cannons made by Genoese artillerymen who were basically mercenaries who were providing the know-how. And then the Turks were well, uh, well known for having formidable uh, cannon casting techniques a bit later on. And there's no reason to imagine that the influx of, of, of Jews from Spain would have not had an, an impact. But I just, um, unfortunately, that we, that there's no textual sources I could think of um, that would connect the dots. So they certainly had the disposition to take the best um, from, um, from, uh, from, the, um, from the people who would be, be living in, within Ottoman Turkey. Maybe I should, I mean, maybe, maybe the Ottoman Empire, maybe I should have been a bit clearer. I use the word Turkish for those things coming from Anatolia. And then use Ottoman to refer to the entire Ottoman Empire because there are things that were made in, uh, in uh, Egypt and Syria that were now Ottoman controlled, the things made in Ottoman Hungary and so um, uh, Ottoman Greece. So it's a, it's a, the production is more diverse than just things coming out of Constantinople and Anatolia. And that, that is a sort of a, a Turkish tradition, but then there is all these uh, additional influences. Um, I see some additional questions, if there's still time. Do we still have time? Yes. Yes. I, uh, nice comments that uh, there are a similar depiction of, um, of single Ottomans and, uh, and other works from Tyrol, including stove tiles. So the imagery of the Ottoman wars is indeed very, uh, very prevalent and widespread. And it's absolutely true. I, I, I remember this, uh, those tiles. And going back to the to the time of Sigismund, so we're here in the very uh, 15, still already in the 15th century, but the Ottoman Turks were already very much present in the mind of the Tyrolians at the time. Uh, Maximilian sent a cannon as war booty from his Hungarian campaign against Matthias Corvinus back to uh, Sigismund, and he said it's war booty, and I, it was earned by you know with our valor, and it was important to him that this would be kept in Tyrol as a memento of what the Habsburg was capable of. I see a question here about Ottoman armories. Um, whether inspired by the design of form for further Eastern countries, Persia, for example, the answer is absolutely. There is influence, Persian influence in Ottoman ar uh, arms. There is also a practice within the Ottoman Empire and the military system of finding the best craftsmen and just taking them into their service. Sometimes they would be hired and compensated and came out of their free will. But also during Ottoman conquest, it was not uncommon to bring back goldsmiths 
and other expert craftsmen from wherever they were back to Constantinople. So there's a series of three swords that are distinctly Turkish in their shape, uh, Yaragan, one um, of which is still in Topkapi Palace and was made for Suleiman the Magnificent. But the workmanship is unmistakably Persian. And it looks like Persian goldsmiths were brought back to Constantinople after a campaign against the Safavids. And they were then to work with their know-how and their respective style for the Ottoman court. And we could probably find parallels beyond um, whip, sort of edge, edge weapons making. Well, unless there are further questions, I'm happy to answer additional questions. Um, yeah, just leap forward to the counter. Um, the marvelous Turkish barrels that uh, mm -hmm. were captured, uh, and just pushing forward the Ottoman influence, that were then treasured by Austrian and German gun makers and remounted uh, on wheel locks and flint locks. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think those were Anatolian art? Constantinople, uh, or uh -huh. <laughs> and it's so interesting. They really were. But is the tradition from the cannon casting, presumably, that they were? Uh, uh, it's actually forged. Years forged. Earlier, Two hundred years mm -hmm. earlier than, than the guns they were. So, so I will repeat. The, I will repeat the question. Is um, it's, the question is about uh, the practice of incorporating Ottoman barrels from Ottoman guns into European firearms, which uh, begins with uh, the Battle of Lepanto, 1571 but certainly reached its peak after the second siege of Vienna in the 1680s. And we see a lot of these barrels being repurposed and integrated in Ottoman guns, in, in European Western guns, some made in Savoy, some of them made in Austria, some made in Germany. And the barrels were coveted, coveted both because of their um, quality, they were beautifully forged, and they were actually um, famous uh, all over Europe for their sort of mechanical properties. But of course, they were trophies of war and so they added value to the weapon when they became incorporated. But Ottoman gun barrel making was clearly um, decentralized. They're not all forged in Constantinople. And it's quite clear that some of them were made in the Balkans. And um, we have a lot of signatures on these barrels. But the names cannot be matched with the existing records that would allow us to say this gun maker was active in Zagreb or this um, gun maker was perhaps active in uh, in Tunis, uh, so we are lacking information to connect the dots, uh, but quite clearly um, that was an important dimension of the conflict, which I didn't discuss as much is the sort of incorporation of genuine Ottoman elements into something then that was distinctly European um, for the for in terms of use and outline. Cross dressed guns really. <laughs> <laughs> There's even blades, Ottoman or Persian blades, kind of combined with European hilts. That's right, yeah. 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 Um, and I think I showed one of them. The, um, the, in this uh, presentation, there was, a, I called attention to a saber and a, and a tuck made and um, assembled in Vienna around 1600 and then presented, uh, I think, by Ru Rudolf II uh, to Christian II of Saxony. And the blade is Persian. Of the of the of the of, of the of the sword, and um, and then the hilt and the scabbards were made around it, in the Turkish style in Vienna, with the name Niklas Gross. We are left to wonder whether he was a Viennese by birth or whether he's somebody who emigrated from Transylvania, as was suggested by a colleague to Vienna. But we have to again think less in terms of of uh, hard boundaries and more in spheres of influence. And it's clear that Vienna was um, and constantly exposed um, to, the, uh, to the Ottoman Turks. And um, these designs, travel objects were collected on the battlefield or presented as gifts, or perhaps at times even marketed. Um, so there was, a, even in Vienna, a neo-Ottoman um, manufacturer for prestigious objects that incorporated Persian um, uh, objects that may have been Ottoman loot themselves, like things captured by the Ottoman in, in battles and brought near Vienna and then uh, repurposed. Well, then no more questions. I thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. I, I, if you haven't seen the exhibition, I exhort you to come to the Consistorisches Museum 
and see um, experience not just uh, Ottoman fashion, but all of the dimension of fashion and armor at this very important moment uh, with extraordinary selection of objects uh, that will bring them to life. Thank you very much.